So here we are again, it's in conservation with, we've been going for 10 months now throughout several lockdowns across the world. And it's really nice, by the way, that there's several people from outside of the UK here as well. I've got a few folk I've noticed from the US. So it's really nice, including a couple of old favorites as well. So it's really good that you've come along. This is In Conservation With. I'm David Lindo, also known as the Urban Birder. Um, my guest tonight is the incredible artist, street artist, who goes by the name of ATM. And before, uh, by the way, ATM, good evening. How are you? Good evening, David. Yeah, I'm fine, thanks. I'm glad to hear it. We are, uh, sorry? Oh, thanks for having me. It's good. It's nice to get, have, a, have a conversation with you. Yeah, I can't wait, actually. Um, we're sponsored, by the way, by uh, Leica um, Sport Optics. So thank you very much, Leica, for, for making this happen. Now, um, before we actually start chatting, let me just break down some stuff about you for the Zoomers out there who may not necessarily know who you are. Now, firstly, ATM, you specialise in painting birds threatened with extinction endangered species street art which is amazing you, you've got a lifelong or had a have a lifelong love for nature um, in particular connecting to birds at their songs calls and the habitats in which they inhabit um, you use your skills as an artist to celebrate the beauty of birds um, and communicate the extinction crisis which is pretty uh, in a pretty important job pretty important role um, your giant wildlife murals um, fill walls across London, uh, in Bristol, and other places, uh, countries like Poland and Norway, and I'm sure you'll be telling us more about that as well. But thank you very much, ATM, for coming. Um, let me just tell you, Zoomers, that the first time I met ATM, actually I was wrong in this, because ATM and I spoke about this previously, and I was completely wrong. I was giving a talk uh, for the London Wildlife Trust, and it was launching my then new book called Tales uh, from Concrete Jungles, which featured on the front cover a beautiful uh, mural that ATM painted uh, of a lapwing. And at the end of the talk, people were coming to the table and I was signing copies. And this gentleman came up and he was just nosing around looking at the copies. And I said to him, oh, so would you like a signed copy then, sir? And he said, well, he looked at me and said, I'm the artist. And I was so embarrassed. I didn't know where to look. And I, <laughs> I couldn't live that down for a long time. But apparently, ATM, we've met before that, didn't we? Yeah, we met once briefly when uh, I was part of an exhibition in Hoxton. It was a human nature art exhibition. It brought together lots of artists dealing with the environmental crisis and yeah different different issues around that so yeah i was painting i was painting a turtle dove that on that day doing a live painting you know what you know what i don't remember or didn't remember it till you reminded me it's one of the very rare occasions i was actually kind of off duty on that night i was actually a guest as opposed to saying anything so i i think i consumed too much wine and yeah, that's, well that's a good excuse yeah yeah it affects the memory but also allows the conversation to flow very well we had a very good conversation i remember now yeah yeah definitely yeah so when you know like you know you think about artists and you think about for example you know picasso and mm -hmm. i'm i'm not you know i mean i'm not i mean obviously i'm not comparing you with picasso because he was never a great street artist but but um you know you think to yourself when was the first moment because it must have been a time when picasso couldn't paint so Tell me, when did you realise you can actually hold a spray can or paintbrush or whatever? Well, I actually do my paintings with paintbrushes. So I use acrylic paints and brushes. So <clears throat> I use spray cans for um, doing stencils, but, but the actual, the big paintings of the birds, uh, I use acrylic paints and brushes. And I, I was obsessed with painting from as, as long ago as I can remember. You know, I've got, I've got, some of my work from when I was five, six or seven years old, paintings of birds. And uh, yeah, I, I was an obsessive, I was an obsessive painter at a very early age. Do you remember the first bird you painted? No, I can't actually, no, no, it's, um, yeah. But I think, yeah, I think I was born to paint birds. And in terms of your sort of life outside of the, or away from the easel or the wall in this instance, 
when did you actually kind of realize you were interested in nature? Was it something you were born with again, or did you have a? Yeah, I was. I, yeah. So I love the birds. I, I love nature generally. I, I love the birds and I love painting them. So the, the two things came together. And like you said in, in your intro, you know, I've always loved uh, wild spaces or yeah, place, you know, unusual places where birds live. You know, I, I, I'm always drawn to those places. So, so the two came together, really. Now, when people think of street art, and we've spoken about this before, when people think of street art, they think of Banksy, they think of spray cans, as I mentioned earlier. Can you give us a definition, you know, you're not a graffiti artist, but graffiti artists are obviously street artists, but is there some sort of, is there a, a difference within that world or? Are yeah, you... there's, lots of, there's lots of camps, there's lots of different kind of cliques. I mean, the original graffiti artists, you know, who used to paint subway trains in New York would look at people who do street art with disdain, you know, it's not, if it's legal and it's it's not done, you know, if you're not risking your life in the dead of night, it's somehow um, not really, it's, well, it's not legitimate graffiti. So it's, it's a, street art is a completely different uh, genre really. And within street art, there's loads of different schools of street art. So it, it encompasses everything. I mean, the, you know, you can see from the different styles, there's people who do abstract, abstract paintings uh, as street art, I mean, so it's a fantastic opportunity really for artists of any persuasion to put their work out into the um into the wider world in a pub in public places and uh just to express themselves so so it's <laughs> the definition of street art really is anything that can be painted on a wall yeah it's interesting because when i used to talk about you a few years ago you know especially before i wrote that book before the book was published people's perception was of Banksy or you know someone with a spray can and interestingly uh, in my life I used to um, I, I used to lead tours for one guy who was actually Banksy's ex-manager mm -hmm. and I used to take him he used to hate being in crowds so I had to take him to Scotland in the middle of nowhere and I remember once being in the middle of nowhere in Scotland walking down a road and all of a sudden a car drove past stopped reversed Hi, Dave. <laughs> There's a bunch of birders in the car. <laughs> That's really embarrassing. But anyway, he was telling me some of the escapades that Banky, Banksy used to get up to. And he said that one of the things they did um, when doing street art was to wear high vis jackets. He said, You got to do yeah. it in plain sight. So you wear your high vis jacket, you're cordon off the road, and yeah. you just get on with it. And people just think you're, <laughs> you're working. Oh, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, I've done stuff like that as well. Yeah. But yeah, because, um, yeah, people, people assume that it's just official council business or whatever they are. Yeah. So aside from walls, I mean, we're going to see some of your work in a minute, but I've also realized that you have recently been doing paintings on banknotes. What's, what's that about? Yeah, that was uh, some friends of mine had this idea to um, like subvert banknotes. And I, um, yeah, I started painting endangered species on banknotes simply because it seemed a really good metaphor for the fact that you know so much deforestation or exploitation of nature is done pure purely for money really for financial gain so it you know it seemed like a it's quite quite a good um contradiction to put them on the actual banknote the birds that have disappeared as a consequence the first one i did was an ivory bill woodpecker on um on american dollar because you know ivory bill woodpeckers that used to live in those ancient forests which in the in the marshlands in the south and they they, they had a, a, i think each pair needed six square miles because and they only lived on the really you know the really old trees and um and those forests were absolutely completely logged for uh, to build the railways so it's quite an interesting yeah it's an interesting um interesting historical subject as as well as um making a comment about what's still going on now in terms of exploitation. Yeah. Why, why this subject of, ex of endangered species? Um, what sort of switched you to that? Well, I mean, when I was, when I was young, I mean, I, I, I seem to be surrounded by, I mean, I grew up in the Northwest and, you know, in a kind of conurbation around North of Manchester, Rochdale and, um, but we had access to little streams and the hills and, and moors and kind of wooded valleys and there, and there was you know birds were common and it was 
in, in you know, the, within the last uh, 20, 20 years or so, suddenly you start to realize these birds that were so common, like lapwings and kestrels, starlings, which we kind of all took for granted because they were pretty much everywhere. They were suddenly becoming endangered. And it was a really profound shock that in my lifetime that um, these once common British birds that were found all over the place uh, were, were starting to dis literally starting to disappear. So, and then it all kind of came together because I'd, I'd done a political art as well. I'd be, I've collaborated with other artists like um, Carrie Reichart and Cara Francesca. We've, we've been collaborating for more than 20 years um, on all sorts of, uh, use, using art as a kind of, so, as a way to draw attention, attention to social issues as, as well as trying to make good art. And, um, and so, well, that, so it all it kind of the the street art painting the birds came out of that really because it and it combined my 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 great loves painting and bird life, but also doing it with um uh, like a kind of campaigning social political context as well because that obviously environmental matters now are absolutely fundamentally important and uh, they could they can't be dismissed anymore really what's going on so. So it, kind of, it, brought, it brought, I found my niche in a sense that because it brought all, all, all the things that are really meant a lot, lot to me, it brought them all together. So um, yeah, it was good. That's great. Um, is all your work commissioned or do you actually sneak around in the dead of night with your high vis jacket on painting on brand? Uh, I mean, I, I used to do stencils and I do stencils, uh, yeah, without, without permission. And I also do, do stuff, um, if if I know somebody who's got a good wall, or if you know people have um, suggested spaces which aren't you know technically permission, but I've done them. But yeah, but um, my, yeah, the, the the big paintings that I do, I need permission really because it takes several days, and I need to paint them in daylight. I can't I can't paint them at night. I can't see the colours. So. Yeah, you need, need floodlights. Like, yeah. Need rigging and floodlights. Um, yeah. Yeah, I'm trying to, I'm really, I've been trying for a few years to uh, chat up the um, the town um, hall at, um, in a town called Kikinda in northern Serbia, where... Oh yeah, I know about that, yeah. yeah, yeah. Hundreds of owls um, congregate every, yeah. every winter, and there's a really amazing massive wall, which I think at the moment has this crazy painting of Mozart on it for some reason. But there's this crazy, mm. a big wall, which I reckon would be amazing right next to the actual... Um, owl um roost itself so that, i'm i'm working on that i'm working right no that sounds fantastic I've, I've seen photos of yeah is it 600 long-eared owls in in the town square or something up like to, that up, up to 800 it's a sight to behold folks yes, sight, by the way this wasn't meant to be in the conversation like this but if you are interested in kikinda and the winter owls always check out my website um the urban bird of worlds because there's lots of stuff about tours to see those owls hopefully once COVID has uh, dropped its ugly head. Speaking of COVID, how, how have you been finding, how, how have you been passing you know, the lockdown periods? How, what's it like for you? I've been finding it really difficult, to be honest. Yeah, the, um, cause like all my, all my work uh, got, got canceled or postponed. The, cause I, I do a lot of paintings for organizations and, you know, like conservation, you know, wildlife trust and things like that. They, people got furloughed so everything just ground to a halt and um and i just think the whole kind of I, I find the whole atmosphere of fear and anxiety disturbing and i know it's having a very it's having a very damaging effect on mental health for a lot of people especially young people you know when they should be out engaging with friends and out in the world and uh, people have been told um to stay in their houses that Neil Oliver came up with a good phrase. He called it government mandated depression. I mean, we're actually being told to do all the things that a really depressed person would do, which is to stay indoors, don't see our friends, don't see our family, don't see anybody, and um, you know, occupy yourself with the screen or watch TV or something. So uh, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't. I'm a, I'm, I don't, um, I don't think the lockdown strategy is a good one. It's going to cause a lot of unquantifiable damage to our mental <laughs> health collectively, yeah. not, just, not just in UK, but across the world. Exactly, yeah. They're talking about hundreds of millions of people worldwide dying of starvation purely because of the lockdowns. So, I mean, 
it's no it's going to be serious and uh yeah and people's jobs and the implications of losing jobs and be made homeless if you put all your money into your business and if you lost your business and all this kind of stuff hundreds of thousands of people in this country are going to be affected like that so uh, and um and there's there's a lot of evidence that lockdowns don't um they don't actually work in curbing the transmission of the virus or they don't they don't work in terms of overall there was a study in the lancet of 50 50 nations and and they found that there's no correlation between lockdowns and overall deaths you know as taken as a whole so they might not even work that's that's a tragedy they cause so much damage but they might not even work yeah sad sad stuff but anyway let's let's lighten the mood a bit um because i'm sure we've all been talking about lockdowns quite a lot recently yeah. um, should we start looking at some of your work if I yeah can, fine yeah if yeah I, yeah if i can share this screen yeah um now can you see the screen well not yet what can you see you can just, oh okay you can see this you see that now yeah yeah that's the, yeah Good, okay by the way um zoomers if you're watching this on um uh galley gallery even try and switch it to speaker view so you get the whole frame uh, instead of looking at a tiny square in the middle of your screen so um please atm take it away yeah this this came out of i was um volunteering with um some artist friends like I told you, Carrie and Karen Francesca, who I work with, we were working on the South Acton estate in West London. We're try it was it was a very run down estate. There's not much there at all, no colour. And we were we were working with the local um, community arts group, Acton Arts Forum, and we're just trying to improve the um, the environment for the residents. And we're also in. Um, do, make, doing workshops you know some art workshops with the young people and just trying to get get um just to make a nicer a nicer place to live basically and this was the the snipe that i um painted and the reason i painted the snipe here was because this road it's on is bolo bridge road and the river bolo throat flows there and uh now obviously it's completely uh it's covered by tarmac as as are many rivers in london and um, I just thought it was a, a real symbol, a really nice symbol of uh, what once used to live here. Because Sniper in the in, in the lowlands, they're really they're really suffering because so much land is getting drained or built upon. And uh, so that was kind of a reminder of what we've lost. And I, on the same road, I also painted a grey partridge and a barn owl, and they're again two two more species that. Traditionally, in this country, have lived alongside human habitation. They're very well adapted to living by people, but all they need is they need the right habitat and the, the right places to nest. And yeah, and barn owls are disappearing because um, modern barns allow them in and things like that. So it was um, that that kind of started me off, and I got a great response from the locals. They, they really loved it and were very appreciative. Uh, so it was very positive. And uh, so that was that's when I realised it was quite powerful. You know that that the power of painting these big birds was um, was really something to carry on doing. Do you think that the locals actually knew what a snipe was? No, no, I didn't meet anyone who knew what a snipe was. A little kid, you know, went past and said, "Oh, look a duck," and things like that. And but people who people, I mean, it's one of the. Um, one of the surprise, well, it's maybe not surprising, but it's quite shocking that people do don't know um, about our native wildlife. As a rule, most people don't. They're they're just not exposed to it anymore. They don't. It's not part of their their lives. And I think that for conservationists, it's one of the challenges to get people um, who don't normally think about these things to get them engaged and yeah. uh, care, you know to care about them. So. Yeah, totally. And yeah. to paint something like that, how do you go about it? Do you have a, a reference sketch you do beforehand? Do you go by photographs or by memory? How, how does it work? Yeah, I, I do lots of drawings of all my subjects um, before I decide. So I have a kind of, I, I usually come up with an idea, but I, I always like to, when I, each wall I paint, I like to paint by eyes so that um, I don't, I, it's not a kind of definitive version of my image. I, um, my my sketch. I uh, I just I, I I adapt it to the shape of the wall when I'm when I'm on site. So it's like a process of um, discovery while I'm actually painting as well. So so yeah, I do have lots of reference. So I have photographs and um, 
and uh, drawings, but they're, they're, they're just to make sure I, I get things, you know, pretty much as ac accurate as possible, really. Yeah, and how long did this snipe take to do? Yeah, I think that took three days, uh, the whole thing, so, yeah. Cool. Yeah, it's nice to come back on subsequent days because I see things that I can improve, and uh, yeah, it's nice to work over two or three days. Yeah. Okay, should we do the next one? Yeah. Right. Yeah, the, and uh, this missile thrush. Well, this was part. This was part of a campaign in um, Greenwich. It was just at the foot of this wall. There was a patch of lawn and uh, a few bushes at the top, and um, there was a local campaign. It was going to get. The council had given permission for flats to be built on it and there was a campaign to try and save it and so the missile thrush was a kind of symbol for that and it was actually ben oakley who has got quite a famous gallery in um, greenwich he he where i've ex exhibited before and he um he found a wall and he sorted it all out so that was a really nice collaboration and um and it also struck me when i was painting this that um the power of kind of images to influence the way people think because um, we're surrounded by advertising all the time, which is trying to sell us products, sell us things that are like status symbols or things of value to individuals. And um, I just think if there were more images of birds and other, other creatures around things that are, are really um, representative of a a healthy ecosystem, a healthy planet, then um, that that they're much more they'd be much more valuable as status symbols. So it's a kind of you know it's an attempt to help um, in a cultural shift away from consumer objects towards a kind of a more general things of value for a more general good. You know, I just I I, I often think what would it be like if, um, for example, planting a reed bed became a really um big status symbol in the community because yeah. um, obviously it's of greater community value than driving a car and the, and the irony of car advertising is that that um you know they're, they're often sold as a kind of a, an image of freedom and uh with the car on an open beach or whatever and they're they're quite the opposite because uh, they they create pollution which is literally killing people and um and they just um yeah poisoning the environment yeah, this uh, missile thrush seems fairly high up away from, you know, people who may want to sort of deface it. How long, oh, would yeah. that, how long would that last, you know, as a, as a piece? Would, you, would that be up? I mean, obviously, if the wall was up, it would obviously be there as, with the wall. But how long would it last in terms of the paint before the weather kind of? Yeah, well, I, I mean, the paint, the paints that I've done, uh, they, they look as um, good as the day I painted them a lot of that, as long as the the substrate is solid. That was a really good solid wall. You know, I prime the wall that I'm going to paint first, and I use the best quality paints. And sometimes I use different kind of varnishes to protect them. So they they really do. If they've got a good, if the if the surface is sound, they'll probably last 20 years or more. I'd have thought. Fantastic. Next one. I've not, I've not noticed in in all the ones I've done. I've not noticed any uh, color fading at all. Well, Even the ones on, you know, directly south facing walls. So, so the, yeah, they're pretty permanent. I like this one. Oh yeah, yeah, Sparrow. Yeah, yeah. This was part. This was a really good um, part of a really good project. This was, it was for a project called Ten Times Greener, and it's on Daubeny Road in Hackney. And it was Friends of the Earth who set up this idea, and they wanted to create a template to um, that any neighborhood could take on and it's basically to improve a street and so they got um they had some weekend kind of get togethers where well um forest recycling project donated a load of planters and hedgehog boxes and then uh, people were putting up nest boxes and um, planting like flowers around street trees and so there were some uh, swift boxes put up and um, there was lots of hanging baskets and uh, yeah, planters on wind window sills. And it was great because not only were all the community getting involved or a lot of them, and so they were getting to know each other, but um, it just uh, really changed the whole environment. And, and one of the, the, the best thing about this was that built into this kind of template, this 10 times greener template is um, 
a crowdfunder for um, a community gardener to fund someone to actually look after all the stuff that has been started because that's you know with these kind of local improvements that often they start off really well but then they they fade because there's nobody there to kind of tend and look after what's being planted so that that was um that was great and the sparrow was like a symbol of um sparrow was a symbol of uh, a healthy environment for small birds because of the sparrow hawks there's got to be plenty of small birds and if the the, there'll be lots of small birds you need lots of seeding plants weeds and um you know other other um nice habitat and a good food supply so that was a good symbol yeah thankfully the sparrow hawk is now um britain's second most um uh, populous member of the uh, raptor family after the um the buzzard and i remember well, i remember yeah. seeing my first sparrow hawk properly back in the 80s in in london i couldn't believe seeing one you know flying yeah. at a reservoir it was like amazing but now you see them all the time yeah exactly yeah well when i was young they were quite rare yeah it was quite special to see a sparrow hawk now yeah. but now yeah i see them in london quite often and it's interesting you know people general people now seeing sparrow hawks i remember being on the radio once and taking them questions about garden birds and someone said you know i'm from surrey in you know southern england i saw an eagle come into my garden and take a thrush i said uh an eagle i said was it um, was it maybe uh, half the size i mean you know it was a thrush half the size of the uh of the sparrow hawk sorry the uh, the eagle and they said no it was massive it was huge you know it's interesting how people they see um, birds yeah. of prey and there's no concept of size at all i mean it could be as back, big as that bird on, on the wall as far as yeah no, no no i know what you mean yeah yeah i mean yeah people often confuse buzzards for eagles well that's what they do in scotland and apparently my scottish friends call the uh people that see in uh, well normally english actually that see uh, buzzards and call them eagles the eagles yeah. the buzzards, should i say the buzzards are called tourist eagles yeah 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 I, I like this. I was pleased with this painting, actually, because I, I wanted to cap, you know, the way sparrowhawks hunt. They're kind of ambush hunters. So they they come, they race along a hedge line and flip over to surprise their prey. And and uh, in this one, I, I wanted to get the sense that it was racing down the side of this house to go around the corner and surprise the sparrows in the in the in Daubeny Road. I think you really captured that. It looks as if it's on the move big time. You know, what's great about sparrowhawks is their hunting methods, as you say, they are they are ambush hunters. But I've seen them, for example, I saw what I thought was a massive finch flying past me heading into a primary school. And basically they adopt the flight of the prey. So he's flying like a bounding like a finch going after these sparrows and the sparrows oh. saw in the last minute. And similarly, I've seen sparrowhawks flying towards starlings but flying in a very direct flight, almost like a starling, you know, flick, 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 and just, you know, oh, directly at them. Yeah. And even, I, I, this is even more rarely seen, I've seen them hunting on foot. I saw a sparrowhawk yeah. running around the ground, running into a bush, chasing something. It's amazing. They're incredible. They've got those incredibly long legs, haven't they? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, so you, do you think they might mimic mimic the birds they're hunting to kind of Absolutely, confuse yeah. them? Yeah, they yeah. mimic the, the flight so the, so the bird doesn't see it to the last minute, which is incredible. Uh -huh. I'm, I'm not sure. Uh -huh. If uh, other accipitors, which is what the sparrowhawk belongs to in terms of family in the raptor world, I don't know if they do the same thing. Maybe my American friends can enlighten me in terms of the ones that turn up in America. But um, anyway, we'll yeah. move on. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, curlews are, curlews are very close to my heart as well. They're just so evocative. They're beautiful calls. You know, they're just a, a, evocative of big, wide open moorlands and uh, there's some there there's something magical and timeless about their calls it takes kind of takes you back to a bygone a bygone age so uh yeah i painted these for this was um a group of 13 artists down at tower hamlets there was 13 railway archers and it was called endangered 13 and it was set up by louis Masai and human nature art and so yeah we each were given um given an arch and uh, there was lots of subject matter from you know of ecological disasters and endangered species around the world but i, I wanted to focus on um on something you know in the, in this country and uh, 
because it can often be, they can you know the the damage which has been done in this country can often be overlooked because there's there's more high profile species maybe elsewhere and um yeah so i chose i chose curlews and uh they they i think they're our fastest disappearing bird aren't they in this country now so you know it's and it is um changing farming practices largely the and drainage of um bog bogs and moorland uh, where they live so yeah I don't know what can be. I don't know what can be done about that, but um, hopefully, if, if more people kind of realise what's going on, maybe more pressure could be put on on um, on governments to restrict some of the more the more damaging practices yeah. associated with modern farming. It's industrial scale farming, really. Yeah, I mean the curlew family per se is really suffering big time. I mean, there's one which is probably extinct, which is the Eskimo curly from North America. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh God, yeah. That was so common as well, wasn't it? Yeah, it was one of those. It numbered in its, its, well, perhaps even billions, but certainly millions. They, they bred yeah. in the uh, Canadian tundra, migrated uh, to the to the Midwest, uh, where they were met by European settlers who shot them out of the sky, basically. And then they carried on a yeah. migration, if they could, if there were any left, yeah. um, to the Pampas. And it didn't take long to wipe them out, really. And then on this side of the planet, you got the uh, slender bill curlew, which has disappeared for unknown reasons. You know, it was once, well, it's never really common, but the last one I think was seen back in the 80s or something. It's just incredible how quickly this, this family of birds is, is declining. And this uh, species, as you say, I mean, for the average urban person, what's a curlew? Even though personally I saw as a kid and even you know, birding, urban birding in London. I saw more curlews probably in London than I did elsewhere half the time. But yeah. um, flying over or being on the Thames or what have you, but to the average person living in an urban area, what is that bird with a bendy beak? Well, exactly. But, you know, like where, where I grew up, there were curlews upon the moors. And that, that's the interesting thing about the Northwest. You know, you get is you get these really built up areas, but it's interspersed with, um, you know, more w wild areas. I mean, when I was younger, there was a, so much more there was just open fields there was kind of rough grassland it was just left you know there was this unkempt land and now so much of it has been built on it's complete it's completely transformed now but there were there was space there, were, there was space for them you know yeah okay on to your next one which i think it's a very familiar one to me anyway yeah 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 again lapwings were were so so common when i was a child you know i remember enormous flocks in the winter on the reservoirs and um again they're such beautiful charismatic birds they've got fantastic flight they're um that and yeah beautiful call and uh, I, I don't know it is it's, it, it is what kind of one of the main impulses i want to paint these birds that are disappearing so that people know what they are so yeah i paint them on urban walls to um draw attention to this yeah i mean i share your memory of the uh, the northern lapwing as it's known internationally I mean, as a kid, I used to see flocks flying over Wembley every July, like flocks, like 50 or 60 of them. And I took them for granted. And yeah, exactly. That, that's the thing. I, I, took, I took all this for granted. You know, you, you kind of assume it's always going to be there. It's just the way things are. So it, it came as a profound shock when, uh, you know, a few decades later, it, the situation has completely changed. And now, you know, you, you see one, even in areas of good habitat you see maybe a couple of a few pairs of lapwings but the, i remember them being in kind of every farmer's field you know there was there was hundreds of them so yeah, yeah. they were the staple and for those who aren't familiar with the song and i'm going to break copyright rules here because i don't know who actually recorded this but let's see if you can hear this let's try it again What an amazing call that bird has, incredible. No way, no way they fly as well, they kind of tumble, don't they? And they've got a fantastic flight. Yeah. They fall out of the sky and then zoom back up again, yeah. That's right. Really for that, great to watch. Yeah, for those who aren't familiar, the wings are rounded. And as a small boy looking up in the sky and seeing these birds flying over, I thought their wings were spoon shaped and actually shaped yeah. like with an indentation as a spoon. So I called them spoon wings. Yeah, it's a good, it's a good description. Yeah, definitely. And of course, by the way, um, that's a cover of my book as well, um, um, Tales from Concrete Jungles, where 
we all kind of semi started our story. ATM. Anyway. Yeah. Yeah, I painted this in. Um, it's a Griffin vulture in in Madrid. In a what was an occupied centre in the middle of Madrid, and I was a fantastic wall to paint on. Uh, you can see it's kind of crumbling and flaky, and also other people had painted stuff on there before, so it was really interesting to paint it in in that context. I, I, I mean, I like painting on walls which already have something something on them. One of the one of the most interesting things about street art is that, unlike painting on a canvas, every wall is is unique, so it each one presents new opportunities and kind of demands uh, new new techniques in a way, you know, like this one was, yeah, it, I was working in relation to the colors and the patterns that were there. So um, that, that's why street, for me, um, street art is always, it's all, it's, it's always interesting, you know, so there's always something new to be learned. I mean, and, um, yeah. I mean, sorry to interrupt you, ATM, but this bird looks almost 3D to me. I mean, the, especially the wing and the body, it looks like it's actually 3D. It's incredible. Uh, how long did this bird take to paint? And were the circumstances, I mean, were you on a, a ladder or something? Or I, I don't know how you do, do you do these things to scale. Yeah, I mean, I don't like painting on ladders. I have done things on ladders. It's really awkward because you've got to hold, I need to hold a palette and my paintbrushes and my drawings and paint at the same time. So it's, so I normally- uh, I yeah, think I ATM, with... sorry to interrupt you. I think you need an assistant. I do, yeah. Yeah. I'm... I need I'm someone in the audience. audience. Sorry? Yeah, I need someone to hold my palette. <laughs> but th this was, this was over, there was a, yeah, you can't see it in this photograph, but there was a kind of shed roof so I was kind of balanced on this shed roof when I was, it wasn't so high this one. So, but I was, I, I couldn't, I couldn't get it. I had to kind of crawl across the shed roof to, to reach it. But um, yeah, I, I mean, I wanted to, one of the things I just wanted to mention was like, obviously you know that vultures, are, you know, have been destroyed on a massive scale throughout the world by diclofenac, which is um, a veterinary um, medicine. It stops inflammation in in animals, and and uh, an unintended consequence of that was that it kills vultures and uh, it destroys their livers, and um, so that any animal that's been treated at any time in its life with this drug, it will automatic it will kill a vulture, and and vultures are incredible. Vultures have got such an incredible digestive system that any um, pathogen that enters them just is eliminated inside the vulture. So there, there, I know in India, there's been huge problems with rabies uh, since since the disappearance of vultures because there's there's big packs of stray dogs feeding on, on dead animals, which vultures would otherwise have eaten, quite apart from other path pathogens that have emerged. So it's kind of a tragedy of um, unintended consequences. And there's, there's so many of those, you know, like, um, flea treatments for dogs um, they contain those neonicotinoid um, pesticides and when dog in in this country in the uk and when dogs go swimming in rivers that le leaches into the water and it's killing the uh, insect life of our rivers and um, unbeknown to pet owners you know and so and you can see i can see this everywhere like every spring it astonishes me that um supermarkets you know, they openly sell um, like aphid killers, slug pellets, weed killers, all sorts of sprays. And um, I think a lot of the people who buy in them to spray their roses, for example, don't realize that when they're using an aphid spray, they're killing the food supply of the small birds that live in their garden. And if they use in slug pellets, they're gonna kill hedgehogs too. So there's so many, yeah, unintended consequences where people don't realize the damage. And, and it's quite shocking that the, the easy accessibility of really toxic chemicals, poisons that we can just buy in supermarkets to put in our gardens. So, yeah. It's, it's, it's horrifying, you know, and it's one of my bugbears. If I'm talking on the radio about garden birds and someone comes on and says, there's no birds in my garden and I blame it on the magpies and the sparrowhawks. And well, exactly. Yeah, yeah. You're probably using slug pellets and you've probably got sterile wooden fencing surrounding your garden and you've got concrete patio and your front garden's probably a car park, you know. Or you're putting weed killer on your on your lawn as well. 
Yeah. I mean, well, I, I lived in Berlin for a few years, and one of the interesting things I noticed about Berlin, there was place was alive with sparrows and lots of small birds, and they they don't use um, toxic weed killers uh, as you often see councils using in this country, going around with a bottle of um, spray spraying spraying on pavements. They use burners to um, if they if they want to clear weeds. So you see. Uh, lots of sprouting weeds all over the place, just on on the edges of the lawns, on you know, in in local parks and things. And that's that's precisely why there's so many sparrows and nightingales and other birds like that. Yeah, absolutely. We need to learn a few lessons over in this country, certainly. Yeah, absolutely. And it, I mean, it could it could change, you know, be, you know, like in in Berlin, you know, the burners they do the job, and they do, but they're not poisoning poisoning the land. And this stuff is overnight change as well. You don't need to, you know, it doesn't take decades if you just change. You know, no, it, could be, doing things. It, it just makes it just means it just needs somebody making the decision who's got the power and it, could, it can be literally done overnight yeah absolutely okay turtle dove i mean yeah another one of the main reasons i um do these paintings is also to try and put, reach new audiences who um wouldn't normally be exposed to kind of these ideas so I did this in Glastonbury Festival uh, in 2016 in Shangri-La and uh, again I was collaborating with my artist friends and we, we were doing lots of different things but I thought it was a, a really good uh, idea to use uh, this extinct symbol with a turtle dove as turtle doves are really heading towards extinction in this country. I think they're down 98% in 40 years so it seemed to um, really fit. And but one of the shocking things was that when I was painting this, I didn't meet a single person who'd ever heard of a turtle dove or knew what a turtle dove was. So it's it's quite something to realise. Even from the Christmas rhyme, not even from you know. Ah, from... ah, it's even yeah, it's such a part of our. Or um, well, they didn't make the association when they saw the bird. That's for sure. They might maybe they knew the rhyme, but there's, they didn't know what it looked like. So um, so yeah, it's. It's, it's, it's such a part of our folklore and yeah, um, songs and poems. But um, yeah, it's a, yeah, that's quite something. But we are becoming more alienated from nature for sure as a culture because we're just becoming more reliant on uh, technology and yeah, it's, it's, the world via, via screens. Yeah, it's interesting. We'll talk about the screen stuff in a minute, but you know the the fact that we're disconnecting from from our environment is is alarming. I mean, five years ago, I conducted the Vote for Britain's National Bird Campaign, and you know, had I done it in the fifties, then the turtle dove, skylark, swallow, cuckoo, all those birds would be in the top ten, mm. no problem. This yeah. time round. I think the nearest any of them got to the top 10 was maybe the Skylark, and that was probably 35 or something. You know, it was just incredible. Mm. But, you know, kids are growing up not hearing cuckoos, not understanding what, you know, what a turtle dove is. Yeah. It's really shocking. And then going back to what you said earlier, I mean, in Europe, the, the population has fallen by nearly 80% as well. And it's the world's only migratory pigeon. And if, you know, it migrates from Europe across mm. Sahara, so across the Mediterranean, across the Sahara into sub-Saharan Africa, and it's in the Mediterranean region of North Africa is where they're slaughtered. Yeah, I know. That's yeah, that's the other tragedy on the on the Mediterranean islands. They're slaughtered in when in both directions on the spring migration as well. So terrible. I know, and and again, you know, like I, I was just going to mention, like far, um, the kind of degradation of farmland because turtle doves used to be common because there were field margins, lots of weeds, lots of um, like little seeding flowers, big, big, a lot, lot more hedgerows, you know, big hedgerows. I, I lived in out in um, Essex for a while and there was turtle doves nesting in the lane, you know, I mean, they, and those, but those things have largely disappeared from um, the British countryside, those, those kind of unkempt fields, and a lot of it is due to the common agricultural policy, which actively um, subsidised the destruction of those kind of unkempt spaces. But again, that's something that could come back. You know, not they could come back on uh, quite a large scale. There's there's spaces where it could there could be a place for that. 
Yeah, we can just have to, just have to look at the Nepp estate in 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 Sussex. Exactly. Where yeah. they they've actually you know revamped or rewilded a farm, and overnight all these birds, including turtle dove, have returned. It's incredible. Yeah, um, yeah. Should we move on to the next one? Yeah, this is, um, well, I wanted to make the point that, um, I mean, bullfinches love um, fruit trees and there's so, there's so many, this is in North London, there's so much scope in London, uh, in urban areas to plant fruit trees, like, uh, for example, the lawns around tower blocks or certain bits of um, municipal parks, they could be given over to fruit trees with, with hedgerows around them. It doesn't, it doesn't even need to be a large area. And it, I, I, again, it could be such a way of bringing um, back a knowledge of nature, you know, because I was thinking you could get um, school children, a local school to be responsible, say for an area of a little orchard with a hedgerow around it. And it would, and it would be part of their, um, their school curriculum to look after it and, and nurture it and also learn about all the things that would live in it as well. So again, and, and so many um, developers and you know new housing developments they're not thinking in those terms they're thinking they plant a few you know single rows of evergreen shrubs as a kind of decorative um, like pretense of of nature and they, there's so much scope for planting native native plants you know hazel beech or whatever and uh, and also kind of creating more uh, nature friendly areas which are left to grow um, grow wildly or leaving piles of logs or piles of leaves and one of the but one of the main problems is now that ma the maintenance of these places is done by like big organizations who have usually have no knowledge of even horticulture let alone bird life and so their job is just to trim you know cut the lawn trim trim the the shrubs and that's it but and, and uh, the argument is always, oh, it's low maintenance. You know, it, it, it's all about cost, but it could equ be equally um, low cost to uh, leave um, leave more areas, um, you know, free for nature. So uh, again, there's so much potential, there's so much scope, and it just takes political will really to uh, change places. Yeah. Should we move on to the next one? Yeah. Oh yeah, Gosshawk. Um, yeah, this is on the edge of um, Walthamstow marshes, and uh, it struck me that um, that that area is is a place where goshawks could live. Where when I was living in Berlin, I, I saw goshawks regularly. They, um, you know, in the in the town parks. I mean, yeah, goshawks. I mean, there's plenty on the Walthamstow marshes. There, there's plenty of prey species. There's pigeons, crows, rabbits. There's there's lots for them to eat. There's some big trees, and uh, I think, um, well, in this country, one of the biggest problems for goshawks and and uh, other raptors as well is persecution. That they're they're not um, they're not friends of um, uh, pheasant farm farming interests, and so they uh, they're shot. And I find that a tragedy because they, I think they could um, they could live. They could live in so many, but they could, there's so many parts of London where they could live. Yeah. Um, well, two things. Firstly, the, the, in Berlin, um, it's got the largest population of urban goshawks in the world. I yeah. think there's, uh, at one point, there was 101 different um, pairs, including six wow. in the Tier Garden, which is equivalent to yeah. Hyde Park in central London. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I saw them there as well. Yeah, it's fantastic. Yeah. And it's also, incredible. The other thing I'm wondering is the guy in the wheelchair, I'm hoping that he's looking at the goshawk and not the bus timings. Yeah, I thought that was quite a good, I don't know. Yeah, there's, I, I got some good photos of people, you know, standing under the goshawk. Yeah, yeah. It was, that that was part of um, a global street art campaign that was to, it's called Colour the Capital, you know, to kind of, yeah, just because there's so, there's so many um, urban walls which are just like that one, you know, quite, quite drab and bland and uh, they're just, improved by um by some imagery yeah talking about imagery what about this yeah yeah this is, this uh, is an eyeful yeah this is like a celebration of walthamstow wetlands which is a real success story in, in the sense that you know it shows what can be done if there's a will i mean um thames water 
uh, the, the Wildlife, London Wildlife Trust and Heritage Lottery and the Waltham Forest Council all came together to um, transform these reservoirs into um, beautiful, um, beautiful places for birds as well as supplying water. So it's a, you know, it's, that's, I think this is a really great example of what, what can be achieved. And uh, this is the biggest urban wetland in Europe. So it's quite, it's an amazing place. And, uh, and they planted reed beds and, uh, you know, created uh, more secluded like nature areas. And it's, 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 it's only been open for a few years. So I'm sure it's gonna develop and become even, even more impressive over the years. Yeah, it's got a lot of fans amongst the birders because uh, some rarities have showed up. But for those who don't know what's going on in this wall, from your left to right, you've got the Great Bittern. Well, actually, it's called the, um, yeah, it's called Great, is it called Great? Well, it's a bittern, then, yeah. Eurasian Bittern, that's what. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Eurasian Bittern. Then you've got Kingfisher in the door, which is really yeah. well placed. The lovely shovel above the, uh, the um, dish, the sky yeah. dish. Then you got um, a grey heron, and beneath that you got a common red shank, and above the grey heron, and behind the shoveler, you have swifts, and finally uh, a cormorant, grey cormorant, beautiful. Yeah, yeah. I mean, another, yeah, that's another thing that's so interesting. I mean, this was a very difficult wall to paint on. It was had a really strange undulating surface, so it's kind of I had to stipple most of the most of the painting I was doing and some walls are smooth and you can do sort of like nice, nice clean lines, which, which is, so it's a, it's a really different technique, but again, um, fitting everything around the windows and the doors was a challenge, but I've, I find these things really interesting. Uh, it's, it's more interesting than just a plain wall because I had to, um, yeah, I had to, I had to make the design work with what was already there. Fantastic. Uh, yeah, that's it. What, what yeah. a great, volume of work you got there it's amazing um thank you so much for uh for for sharing that with us it was absolutely fantastic to see that um we are kind of coming close to the hour mark so i'm gonna ask you the burning question that i always ask at the end of the interview and you've had time to think about it so ATM, tell me what your favourite bird is. Well, it's got to be the goshawk. Yeah, I, they're just, they're spectacular. And they've got such incredible energy and vitality. And they're so beautiful. And just the, the way they fly, I've seen them, you know, displaying in the early spring. And they've got a fantastic flight. And when you see them sitting in a tree in a woodland with these bright white, feathers under their tail uh they're, they're they're amazing and the way they fly as well the way they hunt they're uh, incredible so yeah good and uh if you could be anywhere on this planet notwithstanding the current terrible plague we have where would you be right now all right i think i'd be on the island of north uist looking out across the atlantic this, that's such a spectacularly empty, vast space. With um, I've been on on the beaches there, looking in either direction as far as the eye can see, with not a single soul on there, and uh, it's just it's just fabulous. So it's basically the wind, the sky, the sea, and the sand dunes, and uh, and the birds. Cool. Okay. Um, Zoomers, um, just to let you know that we have some more talks lined up, conversations lined up over the next couple of weeks. On Monday, we have Dr. Amy Jane Beer, um, really nice lady um, who's a, a, a writer and a scientist. And she's actually working on a book about rivers at the moment, but she's going to be talking about women and their place or lack of place within the world of conservation. So that should be quite an interesting conversation. All are welcome, of course. And then on February the 7th, um, which is the following Thursday, um, another good friend of mine, Graham Appleton, who used to work for the British Trust for Ornithology, he's not a household name, but he works tirelessly um, to try and highlight the plights of uh, waders or shorebirds. So he's gonna be talking about 
some of the problems that shorebirds waders have around the world. And on Monday, the 8th of February, um, we have Lucy Jones, who is a, a writer. She writes books as well as writing for The Guardian and other, other people. And she's going to be talking about a topic that needs more people to talk about all the time, and that's nature and mental health, because her latest book or last book was precisely about that. So that's coming up over the next couple of weeks, and I hope that you guys can join us for that. Um, it just leaves me to say a massive thank you to ATM because I know you don't know this guys do zoomers, but I know that ATM is not a massive fan of zoom. I had to coax him with a crowd of horses, wild horses to drag him into his room to switch on his phone to do this. So I really appreciate you actually sort of braving what you hate to do. So I appreciate that. No, it's been a pleasure. No, it's, yeah, it's not. Yeah, it's great. It's great. Thank you. <laughs> Well, he wasn't as bad as you made out. Yeah, but you know, you got you got to hand me up a bit now. And it's just, you know, just to <laughs> say. Um, Zoomers, thank you very much again. Really appreciate you guys being here. It's always lovely to have you around. Um, hope you enjoyed tonight's conversation, and I hope to see you again some sunny, bright day. And always, always take care and keep looking up.